Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's it. Clap your hands to the Lord and let's shout unto God with a voice of triumph. something for your life and he has something for my life praise God well I have a message to preach this morning that I've preached before it's been a long time I think since I preached it here but the first time I received this message and preached it was well over 20 years ago and uh you say, do you have messages that old? Yes, I do. Some of them are on paper. That's You know what paper is. It's They make it from trees. Praise God. But uh, we had another message completely prepared, feeling it strongly. We got it all done, and it just felt it's not for this morning. But this message that I preached a long time ago is for this morning, and so we're going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bible, to 1 Kings chapter 19. <clears throat> I want to mention that this sermon was well over two years in the making. It took me two years or longer to figure out the meaning of what I'm going to preach here today. That's frustrating, isn't it? You know you got something, but you can't quite figure it out. And everybody you ask, they don't give you a good answer. You just think, no, that's not it. And so I felt like the Lord has given us something, and I believe it can be a help to all of us here. If not today, maybe tomorrow or the next day. First Kings chapter 19, verse 9 says, And there he went, and speaking of Elijah, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here in this cave? So he said, Elijah answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. And I alone am left. I'm the only one left. And they seek to take my life. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and a strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. Say it with me. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And with the help of the Lord, I want to speak on this subject, a still, small voice. A still, small voice. Lord Jesus, I need you today. I feel like someone needs this word today. And I pray today that you will turn me, Lord, into the oracle of God, and that I will speak your word with power and with anointing, that your word will be like a precision scalpel 
piercing, Lord, to the dividing asunder of our soul and our spirit, that it will, Lord God, interpret our thoughts to us and the intentions of our heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For years, I heard that God speaks in a still, small voice to us. Anybody ever heard preachers talk about God speaking to us or how God speaks in a still, small voice? And I know that they got it from this particular text because this is where it appears in the Bible. But I want to be honest with you. I'm not so sure that the Lord has ever spoken to me in a still, small voice. I would better describe how the Lord speaks to me, and, and this seems to be common with a lot of people, but for me anyway, the Lord interjects His thoughts into my thoughts. Every sermon I've ever preached, it comes this way, where the Lord imposes or interjects his thoughts into my thoughts, speaking in my thoughts as though they were my thoughts. And you say, how can you tell the difference? And that is sometimes the very tricky business of knowing the voice of the Lord. But there is, there is a certain sense that comes with it. There is a certain movement in your spirit that comes with it. But what I'm really trying to say, it has never been in a still small voice. I have never actually ever heard a voice that I could say I heard it with my ears and that was the voice of God speaking uh, in my ears. Maybe we could say in our heart, but that is not the meaning of a still small voice. And so when I look at this particular text and I try to understand what it was that impacted Elijah and and how he was moved. There's something more to this still small voice than what many preachers have interpreted through the years. And, and in fact, uh, it impacted him so much that when the fire came and the wind came and he refused to go out of the cave, when he heard the still small voice, he wrapped his face in a mantle showing profound respect for God. And he came to the opening of the cave and God repeated to him the same question that he had asked him when he was in the cave. And that is, what are you doing here? And so as I want to understand what this still small voice was and why he was so impacted, I realized that I needed to look at the whole story, maybe the whole life of Elijah, to understand exactly what was going on. And so let me tell you the story, and maybe you can come along in this journey with me. Elijah was a minister, a prophet, during a very difficult time in the history of Israel. It was the time when Ahab and Jezebel were in leadership in the divided kingdom of Israel. And, and uh, they had instituted, Jezebel and Ahab, and particularly Jezebel, she had instituted her own prophets, the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Ashtoreth. She had killed the prophets of Jehovah or the prophets, as the Bible calls them, the prophets of the Lord. And she had personally employed by her own expense account over 450 in uh, prophets uh, to help confuse Israel and lead them down the pagan rabbit trail, as it were, and leading them to a place where they were confused about who is God? Is the Lord God? Or is Baal God? Or is Ashtoreth God? And they didn't have an answer. They didn't know who they should be worshiping because Ahab and Jezebel brought such confusion into the nation. And so God raised up Elijah to be the answer 
for Ahab and Jezebel's confusion. His first mission was to declare there would be no rain. He calls Ahab and he says, Bud, well, that's, those are my words. <laughs> he says, there will not be rain until I tell you there's going to be rain. <laughs> and then he disappears for three and a half years. And no rain comes on the ground. And no dew comes on the ground. The rivers dry up. And the wells went dry. And the people and their livestock began to die. And, and, uh, and uh, Elijah went into hiding. And he was sustained for six months by a raven that was bringing food in. I don't know where the food came from. The last crows I saw, they pick up the roadkill. Amen. I'm not sure where the ravens got the food from, but they brought in food for Elijah for six months. And then when the brook dried up where Elijah was staying, God directed him to a widow and she with a handful of meal and a tiny bit of oil and a cruise. She sustained him for the remainder of the the three and a half years while the, 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 the drought uh, uh, came upon the nation of Israel. And at the end of that time, he shows up again to Ahab and he challenges his prophets and the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Ashtoreth. And he says to them, we're going to have a contest. We're going to build an altar and we're going to put a sacrifice on it. And whatever God answers our prayer with with fire from heaven on the sacrifice, that will be the God we worship. And so he lets the prophets of Baal go first. And they build their altar and they put their sacrifice on it. And all day long they call to Baal. Baal, hear us. Send fire on the sacrifice. They would put the wood on the altar, but put no fire under it. And they called all day. They get up on the top of the altar and cut themselves with their lances. And the blood gushed out of their backs down onto their sacrifices. And all day long, they said, Baal, hear us. And there was no answer. There was no fire. There was not even a peep because Baal doesn't exist. And then Elijah calls the people to him and he says, I want you to observe this. Amen. He digs a trench around the altar that he prepared. He puts his animal on, on the top of it. He puts the wood underneath the animal. He begins to gather the precious water that they have nearby. And they, they pour it on the top of the animal and upon the top of the wood. They fill up the trench around the altar. And then he prays a 90 second prayer. Hey man, I repeated his words. It takes about one and a half minutes. Can I tell you, you don't have to pray very long when you're praying the will of God. I'm telling you, you don't have to pray a long time when you know you're sent by God. And he prayed 90 seconds and the fire fell from the heavens. It not only consumed the sacrifice and the wood, it consumed the stones. It licked up the water that was in the trench. Amen. In about 30 seconds, all that was left in the ground was a black charred hole and a wisp of smoke coming up from it. Amen. And then Israel, when they saw it, they fell on the ground. They begin to say, the Lord, he is God. In other words, Jehovah, he is God. Jehovah, he is God. Hallelujah. Then Elijah tells Ahab, you better get home, because I hear rain coming. And Elijah begins to head for home in his chariot, and Elijah goes to the top of Mount Carmel, throws himself on the ground, and he begins to pray that God would send rain after a three and a half year drought. Amen. And after he prayed and sent a servant to look several times, the Bible says that a hand, a cloud came out of the, the, the Mediterranean Sea about the size of a man's hand. 
and, and, the, and, and Elijah came, came down off the mountain. You've got to read the story. It's amazing. The Bible says the Spirit of God came upon Elijah. This is the one place. If you ever say, give me some place in the Bible where when you folks run around the church and the, what you call running into the Spirit, where is that in the Bible? It's right here. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Elijah. And the Bible says he ran in front of the horse. He was an old man. The Spirit of God came on him. And he ran in front of the horse all the way back into the town. And there was a great downpour. And the rain came, and the ground was saturated, and, and that was the end of the drought, and that was the end of the pain and the suffering, so it seemed. And that night, I don't know if you could imagine what it would be like if you were the prophet, if you were Elijah, to go home. Amen. It's, it's like a preacher after a long season of church trouble. Amen. And then suddenly they have this breakout. Hallelujah. People are getting blessed. People are getting the Holy Ghost. Ghost people, amen, are experiencing God's presence, amen, Elijah goes, goes home, amen, he crawls into bed after a nice hot cup of tea, I'm just, I'm just putting in my own words, okay, hallelujah, amen, and there he is, I can imagine what it must have been like, amen, as he's getting ready to fall asleep, and he's saying to himself, finally, Lord, it's over, finally, Lord, we've made it, finally, Lord, we're in revival. Finally, Lord, the blessing of God has turned this thing around. And then there comes a hard knock at the door. And when he opens the door, there are soldiers who have been sent by Jezebel. With this message, and I quote from the Bible, it says, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She's talking about the prophets. Amen. I forgot to include this in my story, but once the fire fell, amen, and Elijah said to the, to, to the people of Israel, take the prophets of the Baal and kill them all. And so all of the prophets of the Baal were killed that day. And so Jezebel sends a message to uh, Elijah, and she says, so let the gods do to me and more if I don't kill you like you killed all of the prophets of Baal. And the Bible says this, and I quote, it says, and when Elijah saw that, when Elijah saw that, what did he see? We'll get to that in a moment. The Bible says he rose and fled for his life. Amen. He fled for his life. And then what unfolds in our story is a picture of a man who goes from a mountaintop experience to deep discouragement and fear. Amen. We see him in one day. He loses his hope. He loses his confidence. He loses his vision for his ministry. And he begins to flee to a mountain away from everyone and away from everything. And mostly away from Jezebel and, and what she's about to do. And, and as we follow him on this journey, amen, we're going we're gonna to get this picture of what it means when the Lord speaks to him in a still, small voice. Amen. And why he was impacted by it. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I have been there in my life. I've been in this place in my life where it felt like finally it's over. Finally, I've had a breakthrough. Finally, my problem has been solved. Finally, the Lord has stepped in and is going to change my events. Amen. Finally, finally I've reached the place where things are going to go 
my way. And then suddenly, as, as by the end of the night, or maybe by the end of the week, or before the closing of a year, the phone rings, and a hard knock or comes at the door, or a letter comes in the mail, or the ground under my feet gives way. Amen. And the devil, in one of these ways, is communicating to us and communicating to me, to you, it's not over. I'm still here, and nothing has changed. That's what Elijah saw. When it says he saw that, what he saw was the devil saying, nothing has changed. I'm still on the throne, and I'm still in control. Amen. Even though there's been a prophecy, even though there's been an outpouring, even though there's been signs and wonders, even though God has done a tremendous thing in a moment of time, and people are praying like they've never prayed before, the devil is saying it isn't changed. Nothing has changed. Amen. You just had a good week. You just had a good Sunday. You just had a good month. Amen. But I'm here to tell you nothing has changed. And so that's what caused Elijah to rise from where he was, from that place of momentary excitement and flee for his life. Amen. It, it caused him to rise. Amen. And run with all his might. Amen. He ran until he couldn't run any further. He ran until he fell down under a tree, exhausted. The Bible says he was laying under a boom tree. Amen. And he fell into a deep sleep. And while he was there, an angel came by and woke him and showed him that there was a pancake, a cake baking on the corner. And the angel said, you got to eat that. This uh, is too big for you. This journey is too great for you. And, and, and Elijah took uh, that cake that was on the coals uh, made by an angel and, and he ate it. But he fell back to sleep in a few moments or maybe a few hours. He is awakened again. And the angel has another cake and says, arise and eat. For the journey is too great for thee. I don't know about you. That should have been enough to make him shout for joy. That should have been enough to, to let him know, hey, I'm still all right. God is working on my behalf. But he had lost hope in all that, would, all that God was promising to do. Amen. And so he eats the cake. And though he's strengthened, and he goes in the power of that meat, or the power and the strength of that food, for 40 days and 40 nights, he's still discouraged. And he doesn't understand that God is working on his behalf. His mind should have been blown. But when you're discouraged and depressed, you can't see what God is doing to strengthen you. Where are you going, Elijah? Elijah. Where are you running? Where is the meat that the angel prepared for you taking you? I'm going to Horeb. Why are you going to Horeb, Elijah? Because Horeb is a place where other people have found answers from God. You see, Moses met God at a burning bush. At Horeb. Maybe you know Horeb as Sinai. It's the same place. And Moses met God at Sinai or Horeb at a burning bush. Other men met God there. Moses went to Horeb and got the tables of stone and made the covenant between God and Israel. When Israel was journeying and they were wandering through the wilderness, there was water that came out of a rock. 
at Horeb. Amen. Horeb was a place where people who needed refreshing, where people who needed a word, where people received a call, where people got direction for their life, they got it at Horeb. I don't know about you, but we have a Horeb. We have a rock. Amen. His name is Jesus. You've come to the right place today. You're at Mount Horeb today. Amen. And if you're tired and discouraged and overwhelmed, I've got a word for you. Hallelujah. There's a soft voice that's going to speak in your heart today. And it's going to give renewed direction and strength to your life. Hallelujah. Elijah is on his way to Horeb because he needs an answer. He needs an answer. The answer is, what else can I do? What else will work if what I've done doesn't work to turn Israel back around? Then apparently nothing will. I've called fire down from heaven. I've stopped the rain and then called the rain. Amen. We've seen an outbreak of revival among many of the people of Israel, but it seems like the devil is still in control. It seems like evil is still triumphing. It feels like nothing has changed. Amen. His real attitude was, God, I don't think this can be done. I don't think anything can be changed because I've done all of these things according to your will. And it has brought no change in my circumstance. And so he's there in a cave. Hanging out in a cave on Mount Horeb. <laughs> and God calls to him. He can still hear the voice of God. God calls to him and he says, come out and stand before me. I want you to notice that Elijah does not obey. He stays in the cave, but the Lord moves anyway. The Lord already knows he's not coming out. But the Bible says, in, uh, when he calls to him, and this is what he says, what are you doing here? And in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10, it says, Elijah says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I am, and I alone am left. And they seek my life. I'm the only one left. I'm the only faithful one. I'm the only saved one. I'm the only one that knows the truth. I'm the only one that's made the commitment standing for. But look, God, it's not making any difference. They're out to kill me as well. And then the Lord does something, as I mentioned, that took me a couple of years to figure out. It says in verse 11 of chapter 19, then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Just a minute. I've never seen a wind like this before. I've never seen a wind that could tear rocks in pieces. I, I've never seen a wind that could literally rip the rocks out of the mountainside and throw them down on the ground. This was definitely a supernatural wind. This was absolutely, certainly a supernatural manifestation of the power of God. Hallelujah. What do you mean the Lord was not in the wind? And then the Bible goes on and says, uh, hey man, that, uh, uh, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Every one of these were supernatural manifestations of God. Every one of these were caused by God. Every one of these, amen, when that fire came, you've got to understand, we're talking about molten lava running down the sides of the mountain. Amen. Elijah is in the cave, and he can feel the heat of it on his skin. This is not just anything normal. He's not in a forest in North America. He's in the barren uh, rock country. 
country, amen, of Mount Sinai where there's not a tree to be found, amen, for a hundred miles, amen, what he's seeing is God causing fire to come up out of the ground and lava flowing down the mountainside, but the Bible says the Lord was not in the fire. But then it says, after the fire, a still, small voice. A still, small voice. And it says that when Elijah heard it, when he heard the voice, when he heard the still, small voice, he wraps his face in a mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? I'm looking at that and I'm going, well, that's not like, that's nothing new. He said that already just a few minutes earlier. Uh, there's nothing special in this message. Lord, what is this? What is this still small voice? I remember I asked Brother Urshan when Brother Urshan was alive. He was our general superintendent. I said, what is this still small voice? He said, to be honest with you, I'm not really sure what that's all about. Hey, man, he was no better than I was. Hallelujah. But I waited and I waited and I waited and I prayed and I prayed because I knew that there had to be something about this. Hey, man, and then I began to understand, hey, man, that there was a contrast between the earthquake and the fire and the wind. Amen. There was, a, there was a contrast between the visible manifestation of God's power and the still, small voice. Amen. The, 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 the sound of the fire and, the, and of the wind. Amen. And the earthquake and the shaking. It was obviously a demonstration of the glory and the power and the strength of God. But the still, small voice Amen. It literally means a delicate whisper. Something you could almost miss. Something. Amen. If you were not listening closely, it would almost seem like it wasn't there. You wouldn't even know that it was even doing anything or saying anything. Amen. Because it was such a contrast in comparison to what Elijah just saw a few minutes earlier. Hallelujah. In other words, what I'm saying is the message that wasn't in the fire, and that wasn't in the earthquake, and that wasn't in the wind, was also the message that was in the still small voice. You see, Elijah, Elijah had seen God's manifested power already. He had seen God call fire down. He had seen God stop the rain. He had seen God's manifest presence. You and I are apostolic. We have seen God's power. We have felt God's power. Amen. But when Elijah heard the still small voice, amen, what God was doing and what God was communicating, was it, it wasn't in the words that he was saying in a still small voice. It was the fact that he was contrasting amen, uh, himself with the demonstration of his power. He was saying to Elijah, this is what you know. This is what you've come to trust in. You trust when I'm moving and you can see me moving. You trust when you can feel me. You can feel my power. You trust me when you can see me demonstrating my strength and my ability. That's what you've come to trust in. You've come to know that. But there's something that I'm doing and there's ways that I'm moving that is even greater than all of that that you have not come to know. And that is I move like a still small voice I move amen in a way that you cannot see and you cannot detect you call it what you want sometimes it's called the sovereignty of God sometimes it's called the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God but what it is is God moving in a way that you don't know anything about hallelujah praise God Amen. A delicate whisper contrasted against the obvious power of God. Something you can barely detect against something demonstrative and visible. And God was communicating to Elijah that you know this and you're not impressed. You won't even come out of the cave. 
you won't even come and see my power. You've seen so much of my power, you're not even impressed with it anymore. You, you, you hear so much of my, my, my power and see so much of my strength, it doesn't even move you anymore. Amen. Why? Because you, you think it doesn't work. You think it's not producing anything. You think, amen, the prophecies just come and nothing comes of it. The promises are, are, are spoken and preached and nothing comes of it. You see me moving, amen, in an obvious way and you don't even trust it anymore you you like the sensation but you don't think it's going to produce anything in your life but I want to show you another way that you don't know anything about and that's when you can't feel me and you can't see me and you can't hear me but I'm moving in a way that will get the job done hallelujah amen if he hadn't come to know God as moving in a still small voice. He only knew God when God was obvious and when God was detectable. But here, in the still small voice, it seems like God is absent or idle or having no effect. But can I tell you that God does his best work when he works in secret? God does his best work when he moves silently across the landscape of your life. When God moves behind the scenes, it sometimes it looks like tragedy and it all works out to be good. Hallelujah. Call it the sovereignty of God. Call it the unseen hand. We have in the old hymn book that we have that there's a hymn in there that talks that sings about the unseen hand that leads two ways that I cannot see. Amen. God working like a still small voice, speaking his will into existence. And nobody knows that he's doing anything at all, carrying out his purpose and his counsel in a way that is unstoppable and unchangeable and incomprehensible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That doesn't need my help and your help. Amen. That isn't caused by your actions and my actions that move moves like a great millstone in the background of the world. Amen. That puts up one and takes down another. That moves despite my greatness or your greatness or your ability or my ability or your strength or my strength. Amen. That it is not hindered by our weakness. It is the sovereign move of God in our lives. It doesn't matter who opposes it, who resists it. And who rises up against it. It blows past them. And accomplishes his purpose and his will. God was saying to Elijah, this is the answer for your ministry. This is not just in your hands. Oh, I've got to fix this. I've got to solve this. I've got to work this out. I've got to make this happen. Oh, what am I going to do? This took place. That took place. How am, I going to, how am I going to fix this? How am I going to make it happen? I'm here to tell you until you come to know the unseen hand, until you come to know the still small voice, until you come to trust that God doesn't need you to get the job done. He only includes you because he loves you, but he doesn't need you. He can do whatever he desires. He he moves in ways that you cannot see. Hallelujah. If our musicians could come, I'm getting ready to stop. I'm doing things, Elijah, that you cannot see and you don't know anything about. I want you to know, Elijah, everything is unfolding on schedule. Everything is working out exactly the way it should. <laughs> You're right where I want you, Elijah. <laughs> when you leave here, I want you to go anoint Haziel as king of Syria. I want you to go anoint Jehu as the next king of Israel. I want you to go anoint Elisha, which we're going to hear about tonight. Amen, Elijah, as the replacement prophet, you're about to go up in the whirlwind. 
You're, you're about to have the time of your life in this. Hallelujah. I want you to go do this and this and this. And, and oh, by the way, you know that thing where you said you're all by yourself and nobody likes you and you're going to the garden to eat worms? You know that whole thing where you feel like nobody understands and nobody's been through what you've been through and, and nobody has left that stands like you have st stood? I want you to know, amen, I love 1 Kings 19, verse 18, which is just a, a verse or two below our text. It's says, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knee have not bowed to Baal, and, er and, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Hey Amen. You know, you, you think you're all by yourself, but I have 7,000 other ones just like you. You're not alone. You're not by yourself. I have 7,000 other people. You see, you don't know anything about what I'm doing, Elijah. You don't understand how I'm moving and what my purpose is. You're playing the short game. And I'm playing the long game. <laughs> That's why I'm no good at chess. I'm no good at chess. If you want to play chess, go find someone else. I only know about like two moves ahead. I'm going to move the pawn here and the rook there. What are you going to do after that? I, I'll just figure it out when I get there. <laughs> but then there are these other people. They're moving stuff over here to get you to go over there. They're moving this over there to get you to spread your defenses over there and then all of a sudden they go checkmate they planned all the moves ahead they knew where they were going before they ever took the first step before they ever moved their first pawn that's God God's, God's moving his pawns knowing exactly how he's going to checkmate the devil in your life. But because you're playing the short game and you can't see what God's doing, it's a scary ride. And it can be a ride that can lead to disillusioned and discouraged. There's a scripture in the Bible in Psalm 77, verse 19, that says, Your ways are in the sea. Your path in the great waters and your footsteps were not known. What are you doing, God? I can't, I, I can't even see you, let alone see you leading me. I feel like I'm all by myself and the water is all around me. I'm feeling overwhelmed. The water is swirling around me, God. What are you doing? Where are you? Are you anywhere to be found, Lord? I, I can't even see your footprints. They're, 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 they're not there because of the water that's swirling around me. And, and I'm supposed to be following you when I'm out here in the water. And it feels like I'm all by myself. Just keep going. Just keep walking. Just keep moving forward. Just keep going in the direction of the Lord. He's leading you when you can't even see his footprints. He's leading you when you don't even feel he's leading you. He's positioning you when you don't even feel he's in your life because he does his best work when he moves like a still, small voice in your life. <laughs> I can tell you story after story after story. I can tell you the time I laid on my brother's couch. I was driving two hours outside of Cornwall where I was supposed to be pastoring. He had a really bad couch. <laughs> I remember I woke 
woke up in the middle of the night and I had one arm not just under the cushion but right down the back of the couch. And I was crying, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't. I can't be a pastor. I can't. I can't do this. I can't find somebody else. I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. I, I, I don't have it. I thought I did. I don't have it. I, I, I just... I just somehow need you just to support me in some way. I can't do this. I was right where God wanted me to be. Under the water. Way over my head. And God stepped in. positioning me to take over a company that eventually supported me for the whole time I was here with Brother Levitt so I could be the assistant so then I could become the pastor and this year we celebrate our 18th year of being in Hamilton this 26th of August I'll be preaching on Sunday night and it'll be my 26th year of being in this city with you. But from that prayer, from that moment, and from that journey, God was playing a long game in my life. And I was in over my head, and I've been in over my head so many times. And I just held on. And I said, Lord, you're just going to have to do something. I don't even know what to tell you. I, I can't. I can't figure this out. This thing is a mess. But God's got a pathway. Chosen right through the water. And he's going to take you to the other side. Hallelujah. But he's not going to do it by telling you what he's doing. He's not going to be he's not going to do it by moving the water. Circumstances as quick as you think he should. He's going to do it by a still small voice. And he's just going to lead you. And somewhere you're going to look back and say, He was there all the time, guiding me, leading me, strengthening me, loving me, speaking to me, encouraging me taking me to where he wanted me to be. All things really do work together for good to them that love God and that are called according to his purpose. Keep doing his will. Keep living the life of a Christian. Keep your heart right with God. Keep trusting him. And somehow you're coming through the water. Even though you can't see his footprints, he is bringing you through I have a question for you as we all stand. I'm going to give this altar call. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? What do you mean, Pastor? You mean at church? No. In the cave? No. What are you doing here? In this place of fear and doubt? Thank you. 